headed down to Acapulco. I know I'm headed down to Acapulco with the long wax dance where I might have a chance. Yeah, we're gonna head down to Acapulco. Mike Fielding has published a book here. They let me kind of take a peek at here, The Sailboat Diaries, talking about what he has done. Moving around the world is kind of a, a nomad. When I asked him, well, where are you from? He said, no place, I'm just nomadic. I thought kind of a PT, you know, a perpetual traveler, past taxpayer. And I think this is the way to live and the way to do it. He's gonna share with us some of those. And uh, I love the way he talks about the moments of anarchy evolution how he's gone, like many of us, we've gone through an evolution. We didn't start out saying we believe exactly what we believe right now. For most of us, it's a gradual progression. We believe this, we change, and et cetera. He's gonna share with us what he has done and what he's gone through as well. And we're gonna be looking at particularly the ethics of land homesteading. A very exciting topic, so give us a warm anarchist welcome to Michael Fielding. Is this, this working? Very good, thank you. Is this working? Okay, cool. All right, man, I am just so humbled to be here and be able to share the stage with all these people. Uh, I've seen YouTube videos, I've watched Barry Cooper's DVDs, and to be able to be here and share some of my ideas, my story with you guys is really the biggest honor of my life. So thank you so much, Jeff, and everybody who's put on this conference. Um, so I, like everyone, I was born an anarchist and then quickly was indoctrinated into statism. Um, and the public education did, system did a number on me, but it did actually provide a little glimpse of my way out. Um, because surprisingly, they actually taught us that it's okay to rebel against your government. Like that's what our uh, government classes were about, how our founding fathers, not mine, but uh, <laughs> how the founding fathers rebelled and fought a revolution to um, extract themselves from that government. So, it gave me this hint that there was a way out, that I could break free of this government. And pretty quickly, I wanted to make my own country. I thought that would be the dream, to go find a piece of unused land and homestead it, set up my own little anarchic paradise. Well, at first I wasn't an anarchist. Um, so I wanted to go someplace and create the perfect country. This was my dream, to write my own declaration of independence, write my own constitution, and I wanted to set down the best laws to where our society would never have any conflicts. Um, over time, I came to realize that that dream was a little bit uh, far-fetched, to say the least. Um, and what really drove me to anarchy was this kind of obscure mathematical theory called Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem. Can I see a show of hands? Has anybody heard of Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem? Cool, wow, that's actually quite a bit. Um, so it's about mathematics and trying to lay down a formal system of rules that um, will prove everything that's true within the system. And not many people tie it to anarchy, but what I could see from that was that any formal set of rules was necessarily gonna introduce problems that that set of rules would be unable to solve. So the very act of making a system capable of solving social problems necessarily introduces problems that it can't fix. That means unintended consequences are inherent. They're built into the system. And we cannot support a rigid formal social structure. We have to take a flexible approach to uh, our social interactions, to the way we inter interact with other human beings. So that threw a wrench into my idea of you know, designing the perfect government. Um, I realized that we can never write down a set of laws that would make everybody happy. We have to be willing to improvise. So I gave up on the idea of building a country, but I didn't give up on the idea of building a new society. I still thought this dream of going somewhere, getting a group of cool people together to hang out, grow food, and trade with one another, that was still my dream. And I always wanted to do it on this island, Little Nagua, which is in the southern Bahamas. Um, I had found it as a kid just searching through Google Earth when I wanted to build this country. I looked all over the world to find the best island to build this new place on. Um, and so I, I put that plan into action. I started saving money. Uh, I went to college. I almost quit because I could see that it was pointless. But I stuck it out, and I saved up a bunch of money. And when I graduated, I bought a sailboat. I named it Sovereignty, and I moved aboard. Um, it took me about six months to uh, learn to sail and get crewmates, get comfortable on the boat. And then I set sail eastbound with uh, 
no real plan except to go to this island, Little Nagua, and see what it was like, see if we could build a colony on this place. Um, but before I left, I wrote this open letter called Why I'm Leaving America, and I think I'll share a little bit of, with you right now. Goodbye, America. For as long as I've lived, you've been my only home. I've had a wonderful life here. Your inhabitants are almost universally kind, and I've become lifelong friends with many of your citizens. All of my family lives here, everyone I have ever known or loved, and I will miss them all a lot. But after 22 years, I feel impelled to leave. According to your founders, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one person to dissolve the, this is a declaration of independence quote if you don't recognize it, to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to one another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have the right to declare independence. We can do it, we can rebel, we can break free. But at first glance, you look like the greatest of all social systems. America seems like a stable and sturdy structure. People look at it and see strength. They see freedom and opportunity, democracy and unity. But a peek behind the curtain reveals a scared old man desperately trying to maintain an illusion. Your size and complexity hide a simple truth. America does not physically exist. It is nothing more than a system of human interaction, not a thing in and of itself, but the result of a widespread pattern of behavior. America emerges from our beliefs and the actions they compel us to take. We all learn our roles and we play them well. The guards act like guards. The judges act like judges. The cops act like cops. And we all pay our taxes. You exist because individuals behave as if you do. Of course, this seems obvious, but it has some frequently overlooked implications. There is an inherent problem in this sort of system, a cancer written in your, in your genetic code, an inoperable tumor that spells your demise. The problem is choice. I alone control my actions. Your system depends on us adhering to a certain pattern of behavior, but we each have the power to reject it. You will only survive as long as individuals believe you exist and act accordingly, but you cannot compel the choice. You can never take away my ability to choose life without you, to ignore your behavioral suggestions, to act on my own. Oh, but of course, you tried your best to conceal this fact, to convince me that I needed you, to give me faith in your existence, to make me fall in love with you, to count you as my own. You started young, indirectly at first, and then directly through my education. For 13 years, I was forced into your indoctrination facilities, and social pressure pushed me into another three and a half. Without a doubt, I learned many useful things. I had many wonderful teachers who only wanted what was best for me. I am grateful for their wisdom. Far more sinister were the unspoken lessons. Structure matters more than content. Your hidden messages are far more powerful than what is said aloud in lecture. For more than a decade, you required my direct submission to your representative at the front of the class, using all the silly threats that work on a child. You taught me that knowledge is obtained from authority. You taught me to look to others for approval. You led me in the Pledge of Allegiance over 2,000 times. But worst of all, you tried to parent me. You tried to make me realize a familial bond with you, to make me believe you had my own interests at heart. You tried your best to make me choose you, but it didn't work. The more you try to coerce my affection, the more obvious the ploy becomes. All the ridiculous forms of, manip of manipulation that go unseen by the masses are the red flags of malicious intent. My obedience isn't for my protection, but for yours. So I published that right before I sailed out of, thanks. <laughs> I published that right before I left Miami and became an expatriate for the first time in my life and um, sailed over to the Bahamas. Uh, lots of crazy stuff happened along the way. Uh, my propeller shaft broke in the middle of the ocean. Water started flooding in. I had to stuff a bunch of rags and towels to like slow the leak and then I couldn't use my engine so I had to sail, literally sail. I couldn't even pull in to use the engine to pull into the harbor. Um, went down to Nassau where I was able to make repairs. Um, stayed there for three weeks waiting for a new propeller shaft to come in and I never checked in with customs the whole time. Uh, I was able to enter the country illegally and uh, stay there for three weeks without getting caught. So sailboats are actually a really good way if you want to move around the world uh, without <laughs> governments knowing where you are. Um, so after I replaced the propeller shaft, um, I sailed down to Little Nagua and saw it for the first time in my life. And you know, I had found it when I was 14 and this was, you know, 10 nine years later and just, man, it was so cool to be there. And 
I saw firsthand that nobody was defending this land claim. Um, of course, the Bahamas government claims Little Nagua, but that's like claiming to own the moon or Jupiter. Like, what does it mean to claim to own land? Unless you're there to defend the claim, it, it's meaningless. So I lived there for a few days the first time without ever getting caught or like interacting with any authoritarians. Um, and then a hurricane came, so I kind of like sailed <laughs> away and hit, uh, went to Haiti and then on to Puerto Rico and lived there for a while. And after that point, I wasn't really sure what to do because at first I had always thought, you know, I was going to build this colony on Little Inagua. And I'd gone there and like saw, you know, it's, it's kind of desert and <laughs> it's going to be hard to get supplies out here. And, like, is this really the best place to build a new colony? Um, so I sat in Puerto Rico for a while and uh, kind of thought about what does it mean to be an anarchist and do we really need to go to this new land that like the government can't touch? Um, and I wrote this passage called, It's Already Anarchy. It's already anarchy. We're just doing a bad job of defending ourselves. Anarchy is not a particular social structure. It is a perspective. It's the recognition that aggressive coercion is neither necessary nor beneficial. It's a moral code that shapes our perception of the world around us. Anarchy is a way of seeing society, not a type of society. Many people make the mistake of thinking that something has to change in order for anarchy to emerge. The, um, that anarchy means a land without government. This fallacy traps people within the status paradigm. A government is no more than the most powerful, aggressive organization in a territory. Anywhere aggression exists, there is a government whether it's Al-Qaeda, the Mafia, or a modern constitutional democratic republic. Government will never be eradicated because aggression will never be eradicated. And then I have a quote by Ben Franklin. In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. What he should have said is, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and the threat of taxes. People will always try to rob us. That is an unfortunate truth. But we get to decide how we will respond. The threats will always exist, but it's up to us whether we acquiesce or fight back. Um, so I continued to stay in Puerto Rico for a while, and uh, I, at this point I was living off savings. Um, I don't know how many people have lived off savings, but it's, it's a little bit scary because your money just keeps going down and there's no income, so it's like, when am I going to run out? Like, what am I going to do before I run out of money? Um, I was sitting on a couple ounces of gold, but uh, I was really scared to sell them. Um, but anyways, I kept thinking about this property issue and like, what does it mean to claim land? And uh, I had this, another passage called the property perspective. Something has always bugged me about property. It clearly only exists in the minds of human beings. There is no objective way of distinguishing my stuff from your stuff. I can't go look at an acre of land and determine who it belongs to. I have to ask somebody. And if I ask two different people, I might get two different answers. So that means property must be subjective. Ownership is an opinion. Yet the word ownership implies objectivity. When I say something is mine, I don't just mean I feel like it's mine or I think it's mine. I mean it is mine and you can't have it and if you try to take it, I'll defend it. So how can we reconcile these, this contradiction? And on the one hand, property must be subjective because it's in the minds of humans and you have to ask people to find out who owns something. Yet we're using the word as if it's objective, as if when you own land, you own it according to everybody. Um, and I think this contradiction is really a, a really useful problem to stumble across. Um, because there are no contradictions out there in nature. Contradictions are only in our heads. And when we discover one, that means that we need to think further about this idea. So I, I did think a little bit more about property. And I came to the realization that it's just a meme. Property is an idea that spreads from person to person. Property is a really effective meme, and it's become very widespread throughout our species. And the reason it's so widespread is because it, in, it influences our incentives. So when somebody owns a piece of land, they take care, they take care of it. They use it to its full potential. Um, and societies where that is prevalent are more efficient. They use their resources more effectively. We use prices to transfer um, supply according to demand. Um, and by by influencing efficiency, this idea of property has spread throughout the world. So, it doesn't have to be logical. This contradiction doesn't stop it from spreading. We can see ideas spread even though they're not logical. A lot of religions are great examples of this. They spread throughout the world even though they contain internal contradictions. 
Once we recognize that, we can look under the hood of this idea and see what the concept is really made of. We can break property down into the behavioral patterns, the physical processes that actually are going on in the world that don't contain contradictions. So what actually happens when you make a trade? If you try to take this book, I might try to stop you. But if you pay me enough, I will no longer try to stop you. So what you did, you didn't buy this book. Nothing about the book changed. You bought my behavior. You bought my reaction. You paid me to let you take it away from me. Um, so we don't exchange property. We exchange actions. Atoms don't change when we pay our bills, but behaviors do. My groceries aren't altered by handing the cashier some money, but the security guard acts totally differently. Whether or not you call the police when I take something from you has nothing to do with the object in question and everything to do with your idea about who owns it. So um, that influenced me a lot. And I, I got to be on the receiving end of that um, <laughs> ownership being subjective idea. Uh, a little while later, I traveled around the Virgin Islands on my sailboat with um, a friend, at first at least. Um, and I still had these two ounces of gold on my boat. And I was still scared to sell them. And we traveled around the Virgin Islands. I never told this guy about them the whole time. And he thought we were dirt poor. Like we sold some things along the way to make money to fund the trip. And we were always, you know, we never went into a marina because marinas cost money. We were always anchoring and kayaking ashore. And um, eventually we got back to Puerto Rico. And one day my, my boat was drifting at anchor. And so I, I went and put it back at anchor. But I was really worried if I got off the boat, it might not be there when I got back. So I took my last two ounces of gold with me and went ashore, and I went to a friend's house for a little while. And um, I let Jeremy crash on my boat. That's my friend who sailed with me. Um, and when I got back, the gold was gone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I missed a part where uh, I got back, and we um, were going to watch a movie. And I had my gold in my bag that day. And uh, so I said, oh, pull out my computer. Let's watch a movie. And he pulls it out, and he's like, oh, what are these coins? And I'm like, man, I wasn't trying to let you know about those, but those are some gold that I have. And, um, so anyways, I hit him again, but he knew about him at this point. And uh, I got off the boat weeks later or something and came back, and the gold was gone, and Jeremy was gone. And so that was the last of my money. And I lost like $3,000, two ounces of gold. And for me, that was everything. Um, but it turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. Have you guys seen Fight Club? Yep. There's this famous quote, uh, the things you own end up owning you. And that gold had owned me. I was so scared to sell them, I couldn't move forward in my life. I wanted to just sit there and just, you know, pay a little bit for groceries and, you know, I'd sell it when I ran out of cash on hand and I was scared to move on. I was scared to go back to Little Inagua, for instance, and check it out and see if we could actually build a colony. Um, so after losing that gold, I, you know, I scrambled. I started getting little jobs, painting, cutting down, uh, or cutting grass and uh, eventually my friend Carlos helped me get a job at a hotel where I was the beach boy out there selling umbrellas and chairs to the tourists and uh, I was making minimum wage only working 20 hours a week but since I had no bills I was putting away like half of it as savings and um, within a month or two I had enough to fund this trip back to Little Nagua. I also did a GoFundMe campaign we just talked about crowdsourced um, so I pitched this idea of building a college campus on an uninhabited island which sounds kind of ridiculous. Like, why would you build a college campus on an uninhabited island? Nobody's there, right? Well, that was the whole point, was to call into question this idea of whether a college campus is made of buildings or whether it's made of people. I wanted to demonstrate that a college, a university, is nothing more than human beings teaching each other. And you can do it anywhere. You don't, and it doesn't have to be the same place every day. So um, we eventually got enough funding and set sail back to Little Nagua. And, Stay there for a week to, uh, first off, call into question again whether the Bahamas' claim to that land was legitimate or not, and also to prove this idea that you can teach each other. You can learn from one another, and you don't need some institution with fancy buildings to learn, um, especially with the internet. We, it's just so obvious. We can all teach each other whatever we want these days. Um, so I called it the Free Academy. and. Uh, but why, I, why does sailing to an island and building a hut deserve a name like the Free Academy? Well, the name is an intuition pump. I made it up to help us think about learning, to force us to examine the question, what exactly is a learning institution? Could four guys on a desert island be a college campus? Well, we'll be thinking a lot, teaching each other and learning. What else does it take? It's important to understand the hut is not the academy. The academy lives in our minds. Like all learning institutions, it's made of people, not buildings. 
While we were there, though, we did explore this idea of um, whether we could potentially live on this island. So we brought a wind turbine and some batteries and a dehumidifier and a water tank. And I really want the water issue is really crucial if you want to build an off-grid community. That's number one. You don't need electricity. You don't even need food as much. You just need to solve your water problem. So we brought these tools there to see if we could produce water on the island. Um, we actually couldn't because by the time we got it set up, there was like two days of no wind. So like a wind turbine didn't produce any electricity. But as a proof of concept, we could. We, we did it on Puerto, in Puerto Rico before we left. And we were able to suck water from the air, put it through a filtration system, put it in a water tank, have it go down a hose downhill because you need water pressure, and then out a garden spout. And we were able to take showers with that. So um, that was a really crucial part for me because that, that issue of water has stuck with me. and. Um, even when I came back, I, uh, I still had this dream of you know, homesteading, living off the grid. The other word is squatting. Um, <laughs> because obviously, all, people do claim all the land. So you know, whether or not you recognize those claims is up to you. But somebody's going to call you a squatter if you go out and try to live on a piece of land. Um, I've actually been dreaming of these hills over here. I don't know if you guys can see them. But there is tons of unused land out there. And any of us could go out there at any time and just build a hut, and nobody's going to find you. And even if they do, you can just move. <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, after the island, I sailed back to uh, Key West, and I decided to sell my boat. Um, you know, The boat was always a means to an end for me. And it was a tool. And um, by the time I did all that exploration and learned uh, more about myself and what it actually takes to survive and be happy as a human on Earth, um, I realized that you know the boat, it worked for a while, but I wanted to try the, the land uh, to, to squat on in American territory. Because that's why I left at first. I thought, you know, I can't live here with my principles. I have to go somewhere else. But after all that time, I came to realize that even that recognition of government power was an illusion. And they don't own all the land. And you can squat anywhere. So um, let's see. Uh, so I came back, and for a while, I wasn't sure where I wanted to build this next homestead. Um, I traveled all over uh, the US, from Florida up to Boston, and then through Houston, and all the way to San Francisco eventually. And by that time, my truck was falling apart. So I sold that and moved back to Houston, where I had met a beautiful, adventurous girl. So um, we decided to move into the woods together in Houston. So uh, I found this 34-acre plot of land just south of the University of Houston, uh, across the bayou. And I found it by exploring Google Maps, just like I found Little Inagua. And I looked for a big green area, because people don't live in big green areas. So I went and explored it and found somebody who was already living in there. This guy, uh, Doug, had been living in there for three years. And he had been kicked out before, but he just waited a month and went back. And <laughs> not too hard. Um, so my primary motivation for the project was to explore the fuzzy edges of property and ethics. We often imagine the problem of land use as a clear-cut issue solved by titles and government courts. But I'm not convinced this paradigm handles every situation in the best possible way. My skepticism means nothing without action, however, so I moved into the woods to focus my attention on the issue. I wanted to see firsthand what it was like to live outside the title system to find some unused land and start using it without buying it or asking for permission, so that I might discover firsthand what my skepticism entails when put into practice in the real world. I also hope to share whatever I discover with the world and inspire more people to think about the subject. We designed our home as a thought-provoking living art installation to draw attention to the problem of ethical land use so that together we might explore and inhabit the frontiers with respect for human well-being. So that's one thing I want to make clear. I don't think I would squat on just anybody's land, especially not an individual where I could tell I was going to negatively impact their life by doing it. This land was owned, legally owned, by the University of Houston. So that's a fictitious entity. It's just words on paper. It's not a person. So you can't hurt the University of Houston because the University of Houston has no feelings. It's just a word on a piece of paper. Um, so I lived there in Houston for uh, six months, and then decided to go up to Austin to try again. Because I wanted to show it's not just that one place that you can squat in. You can do it anywhere. So again, I went to Austin and um, searched Google Maps, looked for big green areas, and rode my bike out there and explored. And I found a 100-acre woods this time, real close to the city. Like I can bike to the downtown Austin in about five minutes. and. Uh, <laughs> 
this land was owned by Tokyo Electric Corporation, which is some corporation out of Japan. But again, I'm not hurting anybody by going there. I'm not negatively impacting any individual. So I didn't feel anything unethical about doing it. And I squatted there for another six months. And um, uh, have you guys heard of the Temporary Autonomous Zone by Hakeem Bey? Cool, One, you guys should check it out. It's a really cool book. And it kind of crystallized my, um, at least my language about it. Because obviously, I would never be able to squat in either of those places forever. It's not a permanent installation. It's temporary. But it is it's an autonomous zone. It was existing outside of the legal authority of the US government. Now, of course, they wouldn't tell you that. But I, I could demonstrate it by doing something illegal and not getting caught. Um, so this became my temporary autonomous zone. It was a place where I was outside all the laws. Uh, maybe not from their perspective, but de facto. Have you guys heard of the difference between de jure and de facto? So de facto means in practice. De jure means in law. So I was de facto uh, living in an autonomous zone. Um, so I continued to meet other people living off the grid. I found another pair, James and Jimbo, living in an extensive forest habitat across the street from my temporary autonomous zone. They had been living there for two and a half years, and they built up the place by slowly accumulating the free things they found. They got a fence, they have a walk-in closet, they have a mattress in a tent with a tarp roof, and their city are, in their sitting area, there's tables and chairs, coolers, lanterns, and fans. So that's another thing I've learned. As my eyes have become open to all the unused land out there, it's obvious that people are already doing this. There are squatters everywhere. Most people call them homeless, but you could easily say that they're homesteaders. They have gone out and found places that people aren't using and started using them. Um, by any definition of homesteading, that's a way of legitimately claiming a lodial title. That's another kind of fancy way of saying squatting. But uh, holding land in a lodium is where you own land without renting it or paying taxes to anyone. Now, of course, legally, you can't do that anywhere. But practically, you can. People are <laughs> homesteading all over the place. And it's not actually that hard. Um, you do have to give up some comforts, at least at first. But that's another thing I've learned is you can build up the place over time to be more comfortable. You can try to meet all your needs. Like I built a shower system in the Houston woods where it was a, a bucket on a string that goes up to a pulley. And it had a garden hose coming out the bottom. So I could heat up water on a pot and pour it in. And then I'd pull it up the tree. And uh, through the garden hose, I had a garden spout, just like I did on Little Nagua. And I could take my hot water shower right there in the forest. And um, I was pretty broke this whole time. So I couldn't get too fancy with solar panels or wind turbines and any of that stuff. But if you have a little bit more money, you totally could. And when you compare the cost of, say, a mortgage or rent versus how much it would take to set up a pretty nice place in the woods, you could do it for like $3,000. And that might be like a couple months rent or something. So even if you get kicked out after a year, you came out way ahead by living off the grid rather than on the grid. Um, I just want to end with this idea of moments of freedom. Um, I'd like to talk about enjoying brief moments of anarchy and how a slight shift in perspective can help us to live a freer life. When we examine the world today, things can look pretty depressing. There are 200 nation states out there, billions of people involved in the business of coercing others. And they figured out how to use technology to kill us from afar and to watch our every move. Understanding our situation can rightfully leave us in fear. And I think this awareness weighs heavily on a lot of us, a lot of us free folk. But there is a way out of this negative mindset. And we don't even have to overthrow the state to achieve it. All we have to do is learn how to control our attention. You see, our attention guides our perception of reality. What we focus on determines our experience. When we focus our attention on coercion, we see coercion. I think this is the double-edged sword of our awareness of aggression. We need to be able to recognize evil in order to fight it. But now that I know how to look for it, I do look for it, and I see it all over the place. But seeing coercion all the time isn't a fun way to live. And it's not representative of the real world, either. I have to be aware of my selection bias and counteract it by focusing my attention on what's actually happening around me. When I step back and examine my immediate surroundings, very rarely do I witness any aggression. Coercion is an outlier. Of course, the state's aggression is systemic, and the threat is always there. But I believe we need to learn to deal with the threats when they are present and forget the state as much as possible in between. We must learn to see that governments only exist in temporary coercive zones, little bubbles of statism that surround cops and judges and other government employees. But for the most part, the world is free and open. I believe anarchy is a form of meditation 
It's not a type of society or a place on Earth, and it never lasts for more than a moment. Anarchy exists only in the present, never stretching into the fourth dimension. Moments of anarchy are like singular points of light, little supernovas of freedom that only last a second. Moments of anarchy are beautiful to behold, but there's no point trying to sustain them. We must learn to simply enjoy the ride. Now that I know how to look for them, I see people riding moments of anarchy all over the place, and it's contagious. Kids and dogs especially know the joy of moments of freedom, and it's hard not to feel freer myself when I watch a dog playing or a child learning. But somehow, many of the brightest humans, those most aware of the suffering around them, have forgotten how to live in the moment. By focusing on the past, future, and distant suffering of others, we inflict suffering on ourselves. This suffering is also contagious. To free ourselves and those around us, we must practice anarchy by immersing ourselves in moments of freedom. With this perspective, I see a free world and a bright future. Thank you, guys.